Dr. Ruby, will you? Hey, yeah, I would like to recognize her and her work with the, the animals belonging to the Navajo people. She has done this for many, many years, and it's her passion, and it's, it's just what she does for the Navajo people, and I want to recognize her in this moment. I have also been asked to say the opening prayer and a kadole. <clears throat> Nihe <laughs> Thank you very much. At this time, I would like to introduce the First Lady of the Navajo Nation, the Filia Nez. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. 
so today we I just want to remind everybody that we signed the Navajo Nation Spay and Neuter Month proclamation on February 19, 2021 to bring awareness to the overpopulation of cats and dogs on the Navajo Nation. And we were joined by the Navajo Nation Veterinary Clinic and the Navajo Nation Animal Control on that day. And so today we're back uh, to continue this conversation with additional presenters. And so in addition to uh, animal control, in addition to Navajo Nation Veterinary Management, we also have Mr. Tembegay to give us the perspective from the, our Navajo cultural side when it, in terms of taking care of our animals and how they uh, take care of us as well and depend on us to take care of them. And then we also have a representation from Tuba City Humane Society, from Desert View Veterinary Clinic, uh, Soul Dog Rescue, Animal Rescue. And then we have a success story to share with all of you about Hannah. And that will be shared by uh, Stacy Allison from Office of President, Vice President, just to give you an idea of um, an example of, a, of, a, of Hannah's story. And then of course we have the closing remarks by Napa Nation President and Vice President. That is the agenda for today. And I'm very thankful and I'm very glad that you're here uh, with us during this webinar. And then for those of you who will be watching this uh, in the future, it will be recorded and it will be stored on YouTube on the Napa Nation OPVP Communications YouTube uh, page. Uh, some of the items that I just want to remind everybody to do when it comes to cats and dogs is to spay and neuter your pets. Um, when it comes to wanting to get uh, a pet, make sure to look into adoption, not purchasing an animal, to vaccinate and microchip, microchip them. And then a lot of this depends on educating our children, family members, friends, and coworkers. And the other thing is keeping your pet for life, not just temporarily, and then discouraging puppy mills. And one of the ways that you can actually get involved and in how to address this problem is to become a foster for unhomed dogs and cats, and then supporting and donating to shelters, uh, rescue, adoption, vaccination, uh, spay and neuter organizations. So these are just some of the, uh, you know, some of the ways that you could help. I just want to share a quote with you. I quoted this um, during when we were signing the proclamation and it's from Gandhi. And it and says, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. And when you just think of that quote, that speaks, you know, that speaks volumes. When you look at cats and dogs, when you, they're small animals, and they depend on us to give them protection, give them shelter, give them food. And, this, and, and in return, they pretty much do the same thing for us. So just remember, even the smallest actions can have a huge impact for cats and dogs. And then from, just from the home level, you know, having pets and livestock in our homes is good for all of us, especially our children. It teaches them responsibility and compassion. It builds character. And then especially during this uh, time of pandemic, uh, they are here to give us comfort as we shelter in place, as we've all been doing for, I think it's been 12 months now. So thank you again for joining us. And remember, we had to take care of uh, the cats and dogs on our now nation. And this conversation is something that we want to keep uh, going even beyond today's webinar. And thank you again for joining us. Yeah. Uh, thank you, First Lady, for for that and the you know who will be our presenters today and uh, what we need to do as individuals. Um, Dottie Lizer Unishe Kiaani Nishle Ma Yidishkizni Bashishchin 
Uh, welcome and thank you for being here at, at our Animal Welfare Virtual Webinar. webinar. Um, we appreciate you being here today. And, um, you know, I just want to go back to what the word says in the Bible. It says, on the fifth day of God's creation in Genesis 124, and God says, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. In verse 25, it says God created each wild animals, livestock, and creatures to their kinds that move along the ground, and God saw that it was good. So today, we speak about animal welfare. It's all about how an animal is handled with the conditions at which it lives. A healthy, comfortable, and well-nourished, safe, and not suffering from unpleasant states such as pain, fear, and distress is a prime example of animal welfare. As humans, it is our responsibility to ensure animal welfare, such as proper housing, management, nutrition, disease prevention and treatment, responsible care, and humane handling. Also, decisions regarding animal care, use, welfare shall be made by balancing scientific knowledge and professional judgment with consideration of ethical and societal view values. Animals must also be provided water, food, proper handling, health care, and environmental appropriate to their care and use. This helps with the thoughtful consideration for their species, typical biology and behavior. Conservation and management of animal populations should be humane, society, society, socially responsible and scientifically prudent. Lastly, animals should be, shall be treated with respect and dignity throughout their lives and when necessary, provide a human death. So please let's all be kind to our animals a good person cares about the welfare of animals. Let us be the generation of animal rights and not animal cruelty. We can accomplish animal welfare for a better world when we are challenged to love our animals or our pets. We shall pray for them just as much as we pay, pray for our children. Animals can be considered as family, which provides great connection between us humans and animals. In closing, everyone is responsible for animal welfare. Our animals should be happy to see us each time we arrive home from our busy day, our hectic work schedule, or a stressful day, because they know how to calm us humans down. Animals are very thankful for us because they may not know the whole world, because they may not know the whole world, but as owners, you know their but you are their whole world. So a and God bless each one of you and thank you for being here. I also just want to mention um, on March 26th, 27th and 28th, we are having a spay and neuter clinic in Navajo, New Mexico, um, along with Soul Dog Rescue. And um, we look forward to seeing every one of you. We will get more details out there, um, such as the times, um, how many, you know, and I think we're doing it by appointments. And so we look forward to this. And as First Lady just mentioned, we do, you know, we had a proclamation for spay and neuter. And so we want everybody to really understand how to take care of their animals and what we need to do for them. And it just makes them, you know, love us even more. Um, so I appreciate your time. And uh, next, uh, right now, we'll have um, our Navajo traditional history given by Mr. Tim Brigay from the Navajo, who's a Navajo cultural specialist. And so um, welcome, Mr. Brigay.
Yeah, eh, she Timothy C. Begain, she Ado Navajo Nation Heritage and Historic Preservation, yeah, Ado Nashnish, Ado Dikado Animal Welfare Virtual Event, will ya ya hashin so the Yabajon Shato Lichtene, will ya ya da ya, um, would ye a call a ya kuda alt so a yabajon shato lich. Nan and Slinigay and Nanish the Edit Hachin in strong Torich in a Bashishin. I don't have a dash of chedo, but I need a dash of nele. Tohach no holy, I don't go a nashado, a ashiaho, a hot ayan, hitch a dance, a national castle. Navajos have a rich oral history which begins from the previous underworlds and emerged into, the fifth, this, into this world, the fifth world. Animals were part of their emergence into the present world. Now there's much discussion and much debate on how many worlds the Navajos uh, came through and live in today. As we were taught, this is the fifth world, the glidden world. As you know, the first world was the dark world or the black world. The second was the blue world. The third was the yellow. The fourth was the white world. And the present world is the glidden world, the glidden world, what we call today. Each finger on our hand represents a world that we came through. Starting with our pinky is the dark world. The ring finger is the blue world. The middle finger is the yellow world. The pointer finger is the white world. And the thumb is the glittering world. In this world, because we can hold things as, not, as human beings, this became the fifth world. This is why the uh, the deities gave us the name Nohokat the Nebelashlai, five fingered earth people. For this reason, um, in the Glidden world, animals were given the opportunity to repaint themselves and add designs to their bodies. This is the reason why some animals are multicolored. After emerging, after the emergence, after the emergence, the animals discussed the need for a new leader. The bear was the first one to take charge and appoint himself. The first meeting among the animals, they talked about how the world was going to be created and what the world should contain. The animals used the jewels, turquoise, abalone, and jet to make into small mountains then indicate the first meeting among the animals, they took about how the world was going to be created and what the world should contain. The animals used the jewels, white shell, turquoise, abalone, and jet, making, in, in, making them into small mountains. They all indicated that this, these are the foundation of their leadership. At the second meeting, the bear started to take charge and demand things should be done his way during the discussions. At the third meeting, Whomever disagreed with and opposed him was cast out of the meeting. At the fourth meeting, the animals decided that the bear was too aggressive and mean, and this was not the way to lead. The animals took the role of leadership away from him. After the leadership was taken from the bear, it was given to the wolf. At the first meeting, the wolf sat and listened to the animals discuss what kind of plants this world should contain. At the second meeting, he would start barking and lose interest and attention in the discussions. At the third meeting, he made a change for the meetings to be held at night because he, because he said he could think better and be more productive. At the fourth meeting, he told everyone to go outside and bark and howl at the moon. By this time, the animals knew that this was the wrong way to lead the animals found out that planning at night does not work. After the leadership was taken away from the wolf, it was given to the mountain lion. At the first meeting, the mountain lion was on time. He sat, he listened to the animals discuss which trees would be with the world con contain. The animals w waited for him. At the second meeting, the animals waited for him to show up. He was late and the meeting finally started. At the third meeting, 
The animals waited for him again, then decided to start the meeting without him. He showed up halfway through the meeting. He apologized and the meeting proceeded. At the fourth meeting, he didn't show up at all. So the meeting started and ended. After the meeting, the animals sent the bluebird to look for the mountain lion. The mountain lion found him fast asleep. The animals knew that they should not have a lazy leader. At the fourth meeting, he didn't show up at all. So the meeting started and ended. After the meeting, the animal sent the bluebird to look for the mountain lion. The bluebird found him fast asleep. The animals knew that they shouldn't have a lazy leader. After the leadership role was taken away from the mountain lion, the coyote came forward and boasted about what a great leader he would make. So the leadership role was given to him. Again, at the first meeting, the coyote sat and listened to the animals talk about what rivers and lakes would be placed. Can I do that? <clears throat> okay. After the leadership was taken away from the mountain lion, the coyote came forward and boasted about what a great leader he would make. So the leadership role was given to him. Again, at the first meeting, the coyote sat and listened to the animals talk about where the rivers and lakes would be placed. At the second meeting, the animals noticed that the jewels used to create the mountains were missing. The, animal asked, the animals asked the coyote, what happened to the jewels? The coyote said, I haven't seen them. Maybe the mountain lion lost them. The meeting proceeded without them. At the third meeting, the animals were troubled, troubled. At the third meeting, the animals were troubled by the missing jewels. So the discussion was not productive. Again, the animals asked the coyote, about the jewels. He again stated that he had not seen them. The animals questioned the coyote again and again until the big fly said, he's lying, coyote stole them for himself. At the fourth meeting, the animals found out that the coyote was a, was a, lying, was a liar and a thief. So the leadership was taken away from him. To this day, coyote is known as the trickster. After it was decided that the animals could not be leaders, the leadership role was given to the sacred mountains. Soil taken from each of the underworlds were molded with the jewels and made into bigger mountains and set in the four cardinal directions. The mountains obtained the leadership role and to ensure that the jewels would not be stolen again, each mountain were so each mountain were given a specific animal as a protector. Today, Navajos look to these mountains for leadership and guidance. After the leadership role was given to the mountains, the animals lost social structure and ability to communicate and becoming wild. Before animals lost the social, social structure and the ability to communicate, they gave themselves to be used in Navajo medicine bundles or jish. The jish are still used in ceremonies to heal people today. Hide rattles, hoof rattles, cranes and eagle feathers. Deer hides are used for masks. Their images on, are on Navajo sand paintings and part of their healing power. Because of the oral ceremonial history, because of the oral and ceremonial history, there is a spiritual connection between the animal kingdom and the Navajo traditions. This is why the management of these resources are important at tribal, state, and federal law levels. This is why management of these resources are important at tribal, state, and federal levels. Better management of these resources guarantees future Better management of these resources guarantees future generations. That doesn't make sense. Let me leave that part out. Better management of these
this world believe that person? <laughs> the management of these resources are in your hands, and for Navajos, the management and resources guaranteed the continuation of Navajo culture and heritage. Everybody, my name is Kevin W. Gleason Jr. I'm Hush Chris Kimpichini, born for an Irish clan called the O'Gleason and McDowell's out of Ireland. I've been the acting manager for Animal Control since Glenda left us in March of 2020. Prior to her coming to the program, I was the manager five years prior to that for Animal Control. And at the same time, I run the wildlife conservation officers. I'm going to have Stacy Dawes present her PowerPoint. Before I start that, I want to give you a little history of the program. I got some of the best animal control officers in the state of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. I have a senior officer by the name of Joe Begay who oversees mini farms, Tienta, Delcon, and Chuba City area. He has two fine officers. One's name is George Skeet, who covers the mini farm district, and Gregory Pahi, who covers the Kianta and Tuba City district. We have one vacancy, which is for Tuba City right now, which we were able to fund this year to assist in the needs of the Western Agency. We also have two kennel officers. One's name is Tamara Begay, who's out of mini farms, and Ryan Bergen out of Tuba City. They, they're the ones that deal with the feeding and carrying and maintaining of the shelters and animals that are there for a short period. Another senior animal control officer we have is Stacy Dawes out of Shiprock. She covers the Shiprock Crown Point and the Fort Defiance Agency. We have three officers under her, Pat Leo, who covers Crown Point, Vincent Soti, who covers Fort Defiance, and Connie Katie, who covers Shiprock. We have one kennel officer out of Fort Defiance, which is Ginger Yo. Like I explained earlier, the program manager has been vacant since March of 2020. When the program started in 1996, the Nauru Nation gave the Department of Fish and Wildlife over a million dollars to hire 16 animal control officers to address issues on the Nauru Nation. Our current budget right now, which is about 600000 only allows us to have eight positions plus our three kennel officers. That's not enough. We have shelters in Tuba City, Mini Farms, Fort Defiant, Shiprock. We do not have a shelter in Crown Point. Right now, we're trying to construct one. We're in phase two of that project right now. This is a very underfunded program, but we do the best we can for our people because of the health and safety issues. These guys do a thankless job. I just hope the creator forgives us for what we have to do every day when we have to euthanize animals. Because it's very hard on them, mostly physically and culturally, especially being Navajos. Culturally, it really has a big effect on them. I just wanted to give you a little history. And if Stacy Dodd is the senior animal control officer out of Shiprock, she will be doing the PowerPoint presentation for us. Thank you. Stacy? <laughs> Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, my name is Stacy Daw. 
Senior Animal Control Officer for the Navajo Nation. And I'm currently up in Shiprock, New Mexico, working out of the Shiprock Animal Shelter. So I'll just do a little uh, PowerPoint presentation about our program. We have, uh, right now we have four open animal control shelters, Shiprock Shelter, Mini Farm Shelter, Tuba City, Fort Defiance. And as Kevin mentioned, Crown Point Shelter has been closed, um, but we are working on building a new uh, facility for the Crown Point Agency, Eastern Agency. And Back on October 1st, 2019, we did a groundbreaking uh, ceremony and this is where uh, we have a new model design, which is gonna be the, the model design, which we're gonna try to move forward for the other agencies as well. And this is being planned to be built by the Crown Point Police Department. One thing that we're expressing out there is doing the caller license vaccinations and confined. Pets should have collars. License your pets. Vaccinate to prevent diseases. So you vaccinate to keep your pet healthy, prevent disease. Um, this is something that we were doing in 2020, uh, call our license, vaccinate, confine. And we were setting dates aside the first and third Tuesday at all shelters every month from eight to 12 to one to five, we were providing uh, vaccinations at a cost and uh, Due to the COVID, we kind of had to stop doing that, but hopefully when things open up again, we'll continue our vaccinations and microchipping the animals. And again, like I said, we're doing this the first and third Tuesday of the month. Um, if you do vaccinate your animals, you're preventing common diseases of, on your pets for dogs and cats. What we do is we, you receive the rabies and distemper combination vaccine and get a free deworming for your pet. An oral de deworming decreases internal parasites. To find your animals, stop roaming animals within our communities. And on August 6, 2018, we revise our Navajo Nation Animal Control Ordinance. Um, the purpose of the newly amended Navajo Nation Animal Ordinance is to communicate to Navajo Nation dog and cat owners that they are responsible for their pets. And the new animal control ordinance requires that all pets are registered and are microchipped. The animal control program launched with the help of legislative kitty furball, a free microchip campaign for all pet owners that purchase a Navajo Nation pet license for their pets between October 30th, 2018 to April 30th, 2019, will receive a free microchip. Yeah, this is something that we did um, out by the council chambers. We were in a newspaper uh, Gallup article back on October 2018. And new schedule of penalties and fines. The Navajo Nation pet owners are urged to call or license, vaccinate, and confine their pets. Pets require more.
Almost done. Okay, provide animal care for all your pets. All pets are to be licensed and microchipped. All pets are to be vaccinated and dewormed to prevent diseases and decrease parasites. No vicious animals are allowed on the Navajo Nation, including the NHA housing sites. Animals are to be confined and not allowed to roam. So we do accept surrenders every first and third Tuesday of each month. And hopefully again with the COVID lifted, we can continue to do these services. And For Crown Point, it's a long travel for them to Shiprock and Window Rock. Um, there were some changes in the codes which limit a household to four pets. And we recognize the housing lease agreements on NHA. So if they have a rule that limits your pets, we honor that. Um, 1707 covers killing, injuring, or chasing of livestock, equine, poultry, or pets, liability of dog owner. Just remember under that law, if your pet killed somebody, livestock, to the victim, it's worth three times the value of the livestock as the fine. Next slide. Uh, the regulations were approved by the council and the code amendments can be found on the website, www.nndfw.org on the new changes in the codes, which have been in effect for more than a year. Next slide. Thank you folks for your time. We appreciate it. We're, we're glad to be part of this presentation. Um, you folks have a nice day. Sonia. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gleason and your staff, Stacy. Thank you for all the work you do there. Uh, moving on on our agenda, we have Navajo Nation Veterinary Management, Dr. Kelly Upshaw Baya. Um, hello, uh, my name is Dr. Kelly Akshabaya. I work for the Navajo Nation Veterinary Program, um, and I've been with the program for 15 years. Um, so that's who I am and where I come from. So I'm just going to provide some a brief overview of our program, um, kind of some of the things that we do and we see, um, kind of who's all involved, and um, then just some, some common diseases that we see um, and why it's important to vaccinate and so forth. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over right here. So the veterinary clinic has three clinics. The veterinary program has three clinics, the Chinle, Shiprock, and Sabanito Clinic. Um, the Chinle Veterinary Clinic has one extension agent. Uh, Mr. Black Sheep is over there and he's, you know, the extension agent, the receptionist, and he does all the cleaning and everything. Um, he has help from his volunteer. And then the Shiprock <clears throat> Veterinary Clinic, we have an extension agent. Um, one stat tech who helps at the front, and then a veterinarian one day per week. At the San Benito Clinic here, we also have an office aide, an extension agent, and a veterinarian myself. Um, but I also travel to Chinle and Shiparok um, one day a week, every week. Um, and then we have the Navajo Nation Puppy Opera Operation Rescue, who is run by Olivia Holiday, our animal ID, whom Melissa the stat tech oversees, and then our admin portion, um, Ms. Waiko oversees that portion and takes care of us um, that way. 
So our operations and duties, um, the Navajo Nation Veterinary Program operates under two veterinary licenses, myself and Dr. Benali. So we are able to provide these services under these licenses. Um, our small animal, large animal veterinary services, the mobile unit also runs under that, you know, to get medication and drugs and um, to write up health certificates, to move animals. Um, so they operate under our licenses and um, so we have to kind of keep them updated in both Arizona and New Mexico. Um, and then we have the Navajo Nation Puppy Operation Rescue and the Animal ID Program, which helps with premise registration of premises. In order to sell cattle, you have to have, you know, an RFID or scrapey tags if you're selling sheep linked to a premise ID. So it's important now with um, animal traceability moving forward. So our small animal companion services, um, we do a lot of preventative health care. That's probably 50% of what we do. Our vaccinating, deworming, microchipping, you know, our parasite control, and then testing for, you know, common diseases, you know, your parvo distemper, um, your tick-borne diseases. So we, we do that in clinic. Um, and then another bulk is spay and neuter surgeries. We do that weekly basis. It gets full pretty quick. And then any other procedures that require sedation, uh, porcupine quill removals, um, you know, shoot x-rays to hit by cars and so forth. Um, and we also do small animal dental cleans and um, tooth removals, bad teeth, you know, plaque, bad pal calculi and plaque buildup. Um, and then trauma care, hit by cars, dog fights. Um, then we also do treatment of parvo and distemper, um, small animal internal medicine. We get to do some of that. Um, it's difficult to do because you you need monitoring equipment, you need um, blood blood work equipment to do CBC chems and chem panels, and that's just something we don't have at the clinic. So it's really difficult to do. You know, a lot of um, kidney workups or geriatric dog and liver workups. So. Um, that's kind of our small animal companion services. Our large animal veterinary services, we do horse, cattle, sheep, goat work, um, the herd health work, your vaccines and your dewormers. We do have the horse gelding projects that we do um, that we used to go out into in the communities and provide these, but with um, the Kokos and Sagi, we just haven't been able to. We also do our cryptorchid surgeries um, here at Sabanito Clinic, our BSEs, bull breeding soundness exams, and trick testing for the bulls. Um, and then we also do um, regulatory testing for movement, Coggins, TB, bangs, you know, your health certificates. Um, it's, it's a lot of work to get those done, a lot of time to make sure everything is done correctly. And um, so it's, it's, it is, it is a lot of time that goes into that. And then we also do our dystocias, our cattle and sheep, when they're having difficulty birthing, uh, pulling calves or sheep and little lambs. Um, so, and then we also do equine dentistry here at Sabanito and at Shiprock. Um, so other services, we have our mobile unit that usually runs from summer to late fall. Um, that provides, you know, preventive health care. We usually try to hit anywhere from 30 to 35 communities during this time. But right now it's grounded due to the pandemic. And um, hopefully we'll get that back up and running by next year. It takes a lot of planning and scheduling. And um, we can't just, you know, start up. We have to do a lot of the sites, get the OKs, get our equipment, I'll get my schedule and um, go in, you know, with every with all the other clinics and um, making sure that everybody's covered. So, but that is our, our our mobile unit. And then we also have the Navajo Nation ID, which provides premise ID for Navajo ranchers um, and helps them to at sale to get to with their RFID tags and scrapey tags. And Melissa runs that out of Shiprock. So I'm going to just talk about a little bit of Navajo Nation Puppy Rescue because this is an animal welfare topic. Um, and um, kind of that's kind of her Miss Holiday's um, 
project. She's done a lot with it. You know, she does the fostering, the adoptions, both on and off the reservation, and then the spay and neuter portion. So it's a big, it's a big chunk. And as everybody else is going to be talking about, or has been talking about, um, the small animal population and, you know, all the things that come with, a, with the, with that population and what we must do to do our part as responsible pet owners. So she, she goes out into the communities. She's a very active, um, just in 2020, she's moved over 1,800 healthy, unwanted, or roaming dogs, cats, puppies, or kittens off the reservation. That's roughly like 120 to 130 dogs a month. That's about 30 dogs, puppies, cats, kittens a week. It's a lot, and she does a lot. Um, so she does her weekly intakes, her transfers to partner organizations. You know, we do the health checks and some testing if needed, vaccination and deworming. And then a, a nice, a, a good portion, a good part of her project is trying to get the mama and papa dogs either spayed or neutered from multiple litters that she's bringing in. So she works really hard with this program and I give her a, a lot of credit for what she's, yeah, what she's done. Um, so adding a pet to your family is a big decision to make. Um, it's really important to, there's many, many benefits of having a pet, not just a small animal, but a large animal. And, you know, that helps with depression, loneliness, helps with physical activity. Um, it, it brings so much benefits, you know, responsibility. And But you also got to remember that you're adding, you know, basically another life to your family and, um, it takes a, a time commitment and also a financial commitment. So they studies say that the number one cost of owning a pet is vet bills, veterinary bills. And second is the boarding if you're traveling or need somebody to, you know, watch your pets. Um, and and then the third is, you know, feed, collars, um, dog beds, kennels, kind of the supportive care around it. So I've looked at some of the studies it takes they say anywhere from fifteen hundred to to twenty five hundred dollars a year to add a pet to your family and keep it in your family. So um, it is a, it is a big commitment, and um, I just kind of wanted to bring that up. So we'll go into our common diseases um, seen at our clinics. You know, there's the parvovirus, there's a distemper. We've been seeing a lot of kennel cough, our TVTs, and then I'll try to head up on the geriatric diseases in dogs and cats. Um, so zoonotic diseases, this is a big um, topic I like to cover. Uh, they say veterinary medicine, the veterinary field was um, started because of zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are diseases that are transferred um, from animals to people or vice versa, people to animals. It's not just a one way um, transmission. We also have to remember that we can transmit and we can be, um, well, we're animals, we're part of the animal kingdom. So um, it, 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 we, we are part of, of the cycle. And, um, and we also like here with the veterinary program, we like to um, always keep in mind the one health concept, the one health perspective, and that we all depend on one another, that um, the land depends on us and we depend on the land. We depend on the animals around us and the animals depend on us and how we interact and what we do. We're all interconnected and um, it's, it's really, really important that we remember our part that we play in, in this role. Um, so I, um, I just kind of wanted to bring that out and that, you know, zoonotic diseases is huge. They say about 65% of the diseases that animals can get, um, people can get. And I don't know what the percentage is, vice versa, but um, it's, it's, that's the whole reason why we, we try to keep abreast and um, keep an eye on what's going on. So some of the zoonotic diseases are, you know, rabies, um, old lupi, ringworm, uh, brucellosis in dogs and um, cattle, TB, tuberculosis in cattle, Ebola, and then COVID-19 is also another one. 
um, that we so COVID-19 is another zoonotic disease that we are currently dealing with. Um, it is stemmed to come from um, in the animal kingdom and kind of mutated into um, a human disease. And now we are dealing with that disease. So um, uh, veterinary medicine is, is, is pretty knowledgeable in, in those types of diseases and kind of how things mutate and uh, move forward. So, so prevention, it's a, it's a big part. It, this topic in itself, so not diseases, prevention and biosecurity is a um, just a topic, it's, it could be a whole presentation in itself. So prevention measures differ for each pathogen or disease. Some can be prevented through vaccines and a well-rounded deworming program. That's kind of where we come in and you come in and then hand washing every time you're in contact uh, after with your animals. You know, I know we, we like to spend time with them, but it's really important to hand wash and, you know, pick up poop, put them in the litter bags and throw them away. So when kids or other animals come in, the disease transmission is lessened. Um, and also, you know, the contact with animals, just trying to um, use gloves if you're just kind of unsure something doesn't look right. And just kind of just being that responsible pet owner, you know, with, um, say, a neutering, vaccine, vac vaccinations and um, limiting, you know, pet roaming. Those are all... Um, parts of disease transfer and that they could bring something home to your family and just 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 trying to you know control the population and and so forth so um so parvovirus i'm going to kind of go this kind of quickly you know it's where you see the bloody diarrhea the anorexia um the vomiting and there is a vaccine available in the combo vaccine we recommend um vaccinating at six weeks and then starting um, three to four vaccines every two weeks. Um, it's part of the puppy program. It's an annual vaccine. So you get it every year after the puppy um, vaccine. Um, treatment runs for us anywhere two to $500. Other elsewhere could run a lot more. Um, and the vaccine here is, is $50 with for the puppy vaccine. So distemper is the next one. It's also a virus. It can attack any organ of the body. It can attack, you know, respiratory, ocular, um, diarrhea. You see the intestinal portion. Then you also see a neurologic portion. It is in the combo vaccine. It's, it goes along the same schedule starting at six weeks and then vaccinating every two weeks for three to four vaccines and then annually after. Um, the treatment here is $150 to $200. Vaccine itself is $50. It's in the same um, combo vaccine as Parvo. And I also want to be reminded that both Parvo and um, Distemper can be fatal, even with treatment. And it's even depending on how bad the disease and the virus is, it can be fatal. So the next one is kennel cough. We've been seeing a lot of kennel cough. It's a combination of bacteria and viruses and it causes a dry hacking cough. You can see some ocular discharge. They tend to, you know, their appetite goes down. It's just like a honking cough they describe. We describe it's very contagious. Treatment can run up to, you know, $150. Sometimes it's multiple visits. Um, there is a vaccine. It's separate from the combo vaccine. It's the Bordetella vaccine. Um, that's $25 plus an office visit. And then we see a lot of um, TVT um, here on Navajo Nation. It is a cancer and it grows around the vulva, penis, and you can see it here on this dog in the hind end. Um, it's trans transmitted by coitus or mating and by direct contact. Um, we do do the treatment here. A treatment can run anywhere from five to a thousand dollars. They have to get spayed or neutered before treatment. Um, and treatment can run weekly for up to three months, depending on how bad it is. Uh, spay and neutering is a prevention. Um, it decreases um, coitus and roaming and then preventing roaming. So we see it commonly on the Navajo Nation and we do treat for it. Um, the other one is the geriatric patients. Um, they are very difficult to treat. You know, they have kidney, liver issues, especially in your cats and your dogs. They do need monitoring, blood work, and seeing where they're at. 
Um, and, and we just don't have that capability here. But as dogs get older, it's good to see, you know, your, your older geriatric dogs. But um, just kind of remembering that they need blood work, um, maybe starting around, you know, 8, 9, 10, and just doing, you know, annual blood work after. So um, that's kind of it on the disease portion. But I just want to say thank you to the webinar um, people that are watching and that who put this on our clinics by appointment only. We are open uh, Monday through Friday, eight to five. Everything is by appointment. So it don't, it's hard just to show up, but we may not be able to take you. We are booked two to three weeks out. And this is not a live presentation because we are doing surgeries today. Um, and we are about 20 surgeries today. So uh, we fill up very fast. Um, and then also, you know, we, we love to provide services. We get booked so fast. And I know people want to come to the veterinary program because, you know, we're local and we're very cost effective. Um, but we also need, you know, your support from your local, you know, community members and your local officials to kind of see what we do and um, help in that portion of, you know, more funding so we can get more people or get more equipment for, you know, ultimately for you and for your pets and your, the, the family, the four-legged family members in your family. So um, if you have any questions, you can contact us at the veterinary program. It's 505-371-5214. Um, and thank you. We appreciate it. our staff appreciate everything and have a good day. Thank you. Hakone. Bye.
We will go ahead and continue with our agenda. We have Desert View Veterinary Clinic, Dr. Carol Holgate. Yes, Dr. Carol Holgate, you know, she told me that she was a good person. She told me that she was a good person. She told me she was a good person. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Carol Holgate. I'm a small and large animal veterinarian. So I wanted to just give some information about who we are. Um, I started Desert View Veterinary Clinic about 24 years ago with the goal of providing animal awareness and welfare. So what we are talking about today, um, Dr. Upshaw Baya has done a, a great job with presenting a lot of the issues that we see as well and that we treat also. So I'm not gonna go into any of those specifics, um, but we are, um, a team of two, my husband, Elward Holgate, is the technician, and we are both Navajos dedicated in helping animals. Um, and we, and the people sustain us in this area, allowing us to grow when possible. We are a totally private native veterinary practice. We serve Tuba City and many surrounding communities in Northeastern Arizona. We have office hours Tuesday to Friday, eight to five. We take emergencies when we are available and we refer a lot of the emergencies which we um, cannot uh, take care of to Flagstaff. Um, our number is 928. 2836184 and please leave a message. We are located in Tuba City, Arizona on the Navajo Reservation. The purpose of our clinic is to promote animal welfare. And you know, animal welfare, uh, there is a wonderful uh, definition, and I will read it verbatim. It is um, as defined by the American Veterinary Medical Association, the AVMA. So animal welfare is a human responsibility that encompasses all aspects of animal well-being, 
including proper housing, management, disease prevention, and treatment, responsible care, humane handling, and when necessary, humane euthanasia. So a lot of that was, um, you know, went into detail with uh, Dr. Upshaw Baya's uh, presentation. Um, very good um, information to refer back to. So we are a um, we are a veterinary clinic um, that would like to promote um, animal welfare, um, and a lot of times uh, that you know will will involve prevention. Prevention would, could be vaccinations, deworming, um, and insecticides. Um, I know that they, we already went through uh, the spay-neuter surgeries and various medical treatments of so many different um, diseases that are contagious, whether it's contagious to other animals and or people. So a lot of information to go through, but um, that is who we are and so much more that, um, you know, we could talk about animal welfare um, as far as getting them healthy, um, getting them healthy and um, getting them to a point where, you know, they, they are, uh, they, they become part of our family. Um, I, you know, there's also, uh, people that can uh, volunteer to become fosters. Um, and the, the presentation that was before me uh, with Tuba City Humane Society solely runs on volunteers and we call them fosters where they take in um, their strays. You know, I see them initially, we get them on treatment, we get them started on various treatments, and then they they get moved along into usually a home setting uh, where they can start to socialize and, you know, ultimate goal is to get them adopted into their forever home. So I would like to um, encourage a lot of people, you know, listening. Uh, we can we can change our community. Um, you know, we can get that done. Um, you can start by taking care of the the pets that you have, and whether they be big or small, um, you know, get get started and and learn about what needs to be done to you know live a, a long and happy healthy life with with your uh, fur babies uh, and they could also be you know including your horse <laughs> so um, you know just wanted to encourage people to look into fostering if that's something that you know tugs at your heart uh, there's many resources out there. Um, you know, let's get started. And I know that we can all do it. Uh, just start with the first animal. Uh, like to thank, thank you for the opportunity to um, let people know who we are and what we want to do for the animals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hallgate, for the presentation. Next, we have Shelby Davis from Soul Dog Rescue. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of this very important conversation. Shelby had a prior engagement, and so I am Deb Dunham. I've been with the organization for about two years now, a little bit over. So I would like to share a presentation that we've put together for you not only about the importance of spay and neuter and vaccinating our animals, 
um, but what we do as a program ourselves when we're in your communities. First statistics that we really wanna start out with for everyone is the waiting list that we have for our mobile spay and neuter clinics. That number of 2,459 animals was as of yesterday. What we're finding out um, as we're putting the word out about more clinics coming into certain areas, the wait list is growing. Um, our appointment coordinator is thinking about 100 is what's sitting on a waiting list right now to be scheduled. Most of these numbers for the waiting list are primarily females. So for Crown Point alone, we have 183 females waiting to be stayed. When we're looking at litters of anywhere from seven to nine puppies per female, that's a lot of puppies that are about to be or at risk of being born into unhealthy situations. And just like the vets were speaking before me, vaccinating is our first line of defense. Spay and neuter has to be first and foremost as well to prevent this from ever happening. As you can see, every female will have up to two litters per year. And our average that we're seeing is anywhere from seven to nine babies. And that doesn't matter if it is a small breed female or large. We're seeing almost the same numbers and it's playing such a health risk toll on these mamas. This occurrence is not just on our own properties. This is everywhere that any unaltered male is at because males will travel up to three miles to find a female. So it's not just your property being affected, it is four and five properties away that are being affected by one male. We focus on dogs and cats alike. We're seeing this throughout all of our communities that we're visiting in. The female cats are coming into heat at very, very young ages, putting them at very high risk, not only for their own development, but also for the development of the babies. The babies are at much higher risk of illnesses or deformations. The male cats that are roaming around as lazy as they might be, as soon as there is a queen in the area, this is where we're seeing the activity happen. Just like with the dogs, we're seeing a far higher rate of females waiting to be spayed versus males. We have some pretty proud numbers for last year. 1,596 animals spayed or neutered and vaccinated as well. As of current date today, we've had three mobile clinics. We have altered 341 animals. We have scheduled for next weekend, March 6th and 7th in the Cayente uh, Monument Valley area, another 115 approximately scheduled. For the Navajo Clinic, we're still working on the appointments as it will be by appointment. We have no firm number yet. We're hoping for another very high volume number over a hundred, but it's going to depend on the amount of vets that we have available to us. That's an important topic for all of us to consider is that resources are slim. 
having available vets to come in and do the clinics with our team is first and foremost, and then also having a support team. Our support team is certified or licensed techs, and then all of the volunteers. Volunteers are necessary just to be able to help in assisting moving animals out of the surgery area into recovery, from recovery into kennels again to be contained and doing it safely. The important part of this is having true buildings to be able to do this in and partnering within the communities to be able to do this. We're pretty adept at being flexible. And so we have learned to travel with, as you see in this photo, our own canopy where we can contain the animals and keep them cleaner, safer, and healthier. But this is where working with the communities becomes so important. Having an additional building to work with increases our availability of keeping the animals clean, safe, and healthy. All of the animals, when they're at one of our clinics, are spayed, neutered, and vaccinated. Because again, vaccinations play such a key role in how healthy our animals are going forward. As I was saying before, the number of, of veterinarians given their time to any clinic is what designates when and where and how we can do a clinic. The more vets we have, the more support staff we need, the more volunteers we need. The wait list is as high as it is because we have to schedule accordingly to the type of animal, whether it's dog or cat, male or female, and then of course, age and size. Each vet has their own area of expertise and abilities. And so when we're overloading our vets with, like in Shiprock, 600 females that are on the waiting list, those are large females. It's very taxing physically and mentally on the entire team. So we have to limit how many we can do per clinic, how many males can we do per clinic. Recovery takes an enormous amount of staff. It's vaccinating, documenting, and making sure that every animal is taken care of properly, that they're seeing correct care in a very healthy environment. We have been so grateful for the volunteers that have come out for every clinic. Side note for this photo, this was at a clinic we did in Sanasti in December during that really ugly snow slash ice storm. This group of volunteers and vets were probably the bravest I've seen in a long time. Soul Dog works with so many of the uh, animal control facilities, as well as other rescues in the areas. Last year, our numbers were far higher than we really wanted to see, as we would really rather focus on spay, neuter, and vaccinate and keeping our animals healthy. In the meantime, we did and were able to, with all of y'all's assistance, rescue over a thousand cats and kittens, 600 dogs, and over 1,100 puppies. As much as we want to promote adopt, don't buy, we absolutely would rather we take care of the animals that we have so that we don't have to worry about adopting. But since we do, here's our best opportunities. These animals have been fabulous companions. And I know in our records, we're showing that at least all of those were adopted out to very good homes. Every community that we are able to venture into collectively, we see waiting lines like the one you see pictured here. This waiting line started at probably 7.30 in the morning, if not sooner. And people will trickle in all day long, hoping that they can get their animals in 
for at the very least vaccines. We see in here every clinic that we are at that if we could just get them vaccinated, they could hold over until the next time that we're in the area. Our appointment coordinator gets bombarded with text messages and emails during every clinic, hoping to get on the list for the next one. More clinics, more vets, more buildings, all take additional resources. So having the resources available is A, our most daunting task, but it's also the most crucial. As we're starting to fly into 2021, our spay neuter mobile clinic schedule, like I said, is in March, we will be in Cayenta. We will also be in Navajo. April, we're headed down to Dilcon. And for the rest of our scheduling for the rest of the year, you can find that on our, our website page or also on our Facebook page. And on Facebook, we are under Soul Dog Rescue. Um, is the present in closing, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you for allowing us to be a part of this very important conversation. As we start to venture into being part of the solution and avenues that we can all participate in, volunteerism. support, donations, all of it plays a huge role. We love being in your communities. We love working with your, your families. Everybody is so supportive and welcoming. For that, we appreciate all of you. We can't wait until our next clinics and all that we have coming ahead of us. And we hope that we can collectively work together and make sure that we have facilities to be able to pull these clinics off and that we can count on additional volunteers so that we have the ability to take in more animals and help more families with this situation. Thank you, Deb. And thank you to Soul Dog Rescue. Um, next on our agenda, we have Glenda Davis, who is the founder and president of Animal Res Q. I have my slides ready whenever you're ready. Sonia. You can share your screen, Glenda. Okay. Very good. Are we ready? We good, Brent? Sonia? Yes, go ahead and proceed. Thank you. Yad a Glenda Davis, Yenishia, Tampahanishli, Ashihe, Bushishin, Kia Ani Dushiche, Torich Eatni Dushinella. I'd like to thank the Office of the First Lady and the Second Lady for participation and an invitation to participate in this animal welfare webinar. And I'm here to represent. Um, Animal Rescue Incorporated. I am the founder and the president of our organization. 
uh, just talk a little bit about who we are. Uh, our mission is to provide affordable costs, animal wellness services directly into Native American communities. Our values include quality animal services, integrity in all aspects of communication and field services, the compassion for the human animal bond, respect for Native American communities, and we have a cultural emphasis on our humane education. With Animal Rescue, we have five core services. The first one is primarily what we do all the time is animal wellness. That is the vaccinations to prevent common diseases and deworming to decrease parasite loads in herds. So we're looking at cattle and sheep, horses and pets, dogs and cats, um, herd management and genetic improvement services. And we call them tailgate education. So we're trying to grow and improve our herds so that we can eat wholesome food and sell um, livestock that are a quality. We also have our, our hum, humane education component on our website, it says human education. And uh, we also promote overpopulation control and to try to grow more humane communities on the nation. And we are seeking to fund um, youth incentive programs. So we have an initiative that is happening right now and we appreciate and would like everyone's support. Uh, this initiative is called the No Place Like Home Challenge for the Navajo Nation. We were selected to participate in a national competition. It's an event called No Place Like Home and it's by Maddie's Fund. Animal Rescue Incorporated is in competition with larger cities, larger animal shelters, entities that have budgets a lot bigger than what we have for our small nonprofit. What we are doing is we are wanting to bring communities together to challenge them to change their mindset to understand that the best place for, home, for a pet is at home. And so in our case, it's to unify our tribal nation. And it's a reservation-wide reservation -wide event, excuse me. So with the support of the Office of the President, and you can see we do have a proclamation for the month of March. It is the No Place Like Home Challenge. We are asking and trying to activate and call to action all the Navajo Nation pet owners to in the month of March, the 1st through the 31st, to microchip your pet at the nearest veterinary clinic and animal shelter or animal organization, secure a pet ID tag and collar, vaccinate, deworm, and confine your pet, and repair fencing and keep your pet at home. So right now we do have partnered with the Navajo Nation and that's through the proclamation. The animal control program, uh, Navajo Nation Puppy Rescue, Operation Puppy Rescue, the NHA, Navajo Housing Authority, Indian Health Services, and all of their um, housing for their staff, animal organizations from the Best Friends um, Partner Group, and Midwestern University. We're seeking to partner with other clustered housing sites in this initiative for No Place Like Home, the Navajo Nation School Board Association, Navajo Employee Housing, and then the, the five other 638 facilities, as well as the individual Navajo Nation chapters. So just to let you know a little bit of what we've done on the Navajo, Na on the Navajo Nation with Animal Rescue, some of our past events, uh, we've secured a transport trailer for to transport puppies off the nation. Um, we partnered with Best Friends Animal Shelter, Best Friends Humane Society, um, and we picked up four pallets of pet food to be delivered to the elderly for their pets. And then we had an initiative and a partnership through the Arizona Friends of Animals and the Najee Foundation, where we brought in 42 pallets, three semi-loads of pet food to the COVID warehouse. 
And then we also have been doing our herd animal wellness services out in the field. And you can see this is our trailer. This is where we went ahead and um, delivered the pallets of pet food for the elderly. And then one of the semi loads for the pet food and then our herd services. So some of our future planning for animal rescue is we were awarded a winter gift through Maddie's Fund, and that funding is gonna be used to help foster and transport puppies off the nation. We, would, we have been approached to renew the Best Friend Spay Neuter Voucher Program, and Animal Rescue will house that program and partner with veterinary, private veterinary, veterinary services. We also ha have a proposal for chapter use initiatives and com uh, community improvement projects, as well as to add in climate change and what youth can do with climate change, pro climate change projects. And then our final proposal is um, livestock management and genetic improvement. Um, that's a grant and we hope to be awarded. So I wanted to thank each of you for all of your work on Navajo, for the animals of Navajo. I know there, there is a lot of work to be done out there. Um, for animal rescue, we would like to partner, we would like to collaborate, we would like to join in on what we can do to make Navajo Nation a better place for the health and safety and welfare of our people. And this information here on this slide is how you're able to reach us. And I appreciate your time and participation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenda, for all your work um, with Animal Rescue. Moving along, we have Stacy Allison from Office of the President and Vice President to share our puppy success story. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stacy Allison. Kia ani nishle, ishihi bashishchin, hanagahni dishache, lugi dishamela. I am the Deputy Legal Counsel here at the Office of the President and Vice President. And I just wanted to share um, a story of a uh, stray that was here in the um, parking lot outside of um, the Office of the President and Vice President. Um, as you know, our office is located um, right at the um, Veterans Park. So there's a lot of um, stray dogs that um, are around this area, but there was one particular dog um, named, well, we named her Hannah. Uh, some of the other staff, um, one other name I heard was Skeeter. Um, and I'm gonna share a photo of her, of how she looked um, when she was here uh, at our office. Um, hold on. Can everyone see that? No, no password. Okay, so um, I, I wasn't able to share the photo, but um, she, um, she, this was back in about uh, the summer of 2019. And we all kind of um, just started uh, feeding her uh, when we would see her and she was really skittish and shy. She didn't, um, she wasn't with any other, running with any other dogs. Um, and then we slowly gained her, her trust. She got to know us and, um, oh, there she is. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I started bringing dog food. Um, my supervisor, LaVon Henry would bring dog food. Uh, we would all um, just, you know, we got to know her and she'd see us pull in in the morning and come running down. She used to sit up on the um, rocks that are above the office and even up, we would see her up on the window rock. Um, and uh, we wanted to be able to um, tame her, 
so that we could um, catch her and get her spayed, get her vaccinations, get her checked out, and hopefully um, maybe one of us could take her home. Um, but um, so we weren't able to, she, she just wouldn't come, she wouldn't come to me. Um, she would let me get close, but I couldn't touch her. And so then the pandemic came along in March of 2020. And, um, you know, at that time, there was, wasn't a lot of us here in the office. And so um, we would still come in and um, check on her, feed her. My boss was here every day um, and he would feed her. And then, okay, and there she is. Um, this was in February of 2020. And um, she eventually, um, also the, the vendors were here um, at the, the Veterans Park and they would feed her as well. So she got to know a lot of, a lot of us that are around here. And she even um, approached one of the CNN news crew when they were here filming um, or um, doing interviews during the pandemic. And so she did, you know, she did get a lot of attention. And um, in the summer of 2020, uh, we noticed that we didn't see her and uh, we were, you know, concerned about her whereabouts. And um, I know that um, she, at one time we did notice that she looked like she was going to have puppies and, um, and then, but we never saw her puppies. And we concluded that she had um, hidden her puppies up by the window rock because that's where we would see her. Um, but we did come to find out that um, she was rescued, that I, I believe it was one of the vendors was able to gain her trust and catch her. And um, Soul Dog Rescue, who we just heard from, was able to um, transport her up to um, Denver and she was placed in a foster home up in Denver and um, she became a foster fail, uh, what we refer to as when the fosters decide to adopt the um, dog that they're fostering. So this is Hannah now in her foster home in Denver and she's a healthy, happy dog. And um, she's just one of the many stories that, um, success stories from around here. I also have my own foster fail at home that I um, rescued and fostered. And I currently also foster for Black Cat Humane Society. So um, thank you for um, listening to my story and thank you to all the um, rescues and organizations that work here on the nation and animal control, the veterinary services and um, everyone else that has presented today. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story, Stacy. Um, we will move on to the closing of our virtual webinar today. I just wanna thank everyone for tuning in and joining us. So we'll move right along with closing remarks by Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez. Sorry, you got to have one of those at least once uh, where you start your discussion and you find out you're on mute. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, we're going to the closing of the Navajo Nation Office of the First Lady and Second Lady uh, Animal Welfare virtual webinar. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who participated in uh, this session today. And 
thank you to the first lady, Ophelia Nez, and second lady, Dottie Lizer, for bringing this uh, very important topic uh, to the forefront here on the Navajo Nation. You know, we are, uh, I think, uh, let me just go back to our proclamation that we uh, assigned uh, a week ago, where the first lady quoted uh, Gandhi in, in, in his total commitment to nonviolence, Ga Gandhi always included the animals. And at that proclamation citing the first lady uh, quoted Gandhi, and, and this is what Gandhi said, the greatness, listen to this, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. Let me, let me say that again. The greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. And I think uh, we have to begin to, not just our livestock, but to also look at our animals that may be neglected throughout the Navajo Nation. And there are various factors of why animals get neglected. You know, through this pandemic, over a thousand of our Navajo citizens lost their lives to COVID-19. And I'm sure many of them had animals and pets. And maybe now they're not being taken care of. And so that's where we as citizens should step up and to see how those animals are doing. And there's other factors in how some of our animals are, are neglected here on Navajo Nation. And you heard a story of, I call, I call uh, Hannah the CNN Hannah. Uh, you know, you had some heavy hitters here in the national media. And, this uh, young dog got to meet uh, folks from all over the country here on the Navajo Nation, that visited the Navajo Nation. So we encourage, of course, responsible pet ownership. Um, so Ishi <laughs> And other encouragement is to research some of these Navajo Nation animal control laws. And many of them were mentioned today. You know, there are restrictions. We just don't have the resources uh, to enforce at times. But the enforcement should be on us as Navajo citizens. And you heard a story from Historic and Heritage Preservation Department from Tim Begay about the, the cultural aspects of our families and our animals. 
and a disagreement that happened, you know, that's a part of our teaching and our way of life, my Navajo relatives, which we can share with our visitors. Vaccines, you know, there, there is some concern, does COVID-19, um, are, are they within our animals? You know, a lot of studies happen and vaccinating our, our animals is, is very important. Spay and neuter so that there's no overpopulation. And we've gotten statistics of how overpopulated our, our pets are here on the Navajo Nation. There are resources available, and that's what the First Lady and Second Lady are doing to provide resources to, uh, to the pet owners. Uh, you know, having a pet takes a lot of responsibility. Having animals takes a lot of responsibility. My wife said it. Uh, at our proclamation signing, if you're able to take care of a pet or even a plant, helps you to take care of someone else, maybe a spouse or even children in the long run. That's the teaching that has been handed down from one generation to the next in adoption and rescue. And that's what this event is, I'm hoping moving us towards, to bring in resources for adoption to rescue. Not just our dogs or our cats, those pets, but even our horses that are running astray, that are uh, feral horses uh, in our communities. So last uh, week, we had the Spay and Neuter Awareness Month in February. And Animal Rescue with Glenda Davis uh, encouraged uh, everyone to be able to take care uh, of our animals. So lastly, I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Shabala, the Fish and Wildlife Department, Gloria Tom, Kevin Gleason. They mentioned there are 250,000 stray animals out there. Uh, Historic and Heritage Preservation Department, Tim Begay, Veterinary Management, Dr. Kelly Upshaw with the, uh, Dr. Kelly Upshaw, via, uh, those service that are provided by the veterinary clinic, uh, Desert View Veterinary Clinic, Dr. Carol Holgate from Tuba City, 24 years providing veterinary services. Now we used to take our, our, our pets to her uh, for vaccinations uh, when we were in, in the Tuba City area. Nonprofits providing services on the Navajo Nation. Thank you, Tuba City Humane Society, Rose Moon, Moonwater, the president, the Humane Society, Soul Dog Rescue from Den Denver, Colorado, uh, that have established the spay and neuter clinics across the Navajo Nation. Office of the First Lady and Second Lady have partnered with Soul Dog Rescue for spay and neuter clinic. So listen out for that. Uh, I believe it's on March 27th and 28th. And so thank you so much for the opportunity to say some closing remarks and uh, we look forward to having more of these types of discussions um, facilitated, facilitated by our first and second ladies of the Navajo Nation. So, oh, yeah, Vice President
Thank you so much and have a good day. And we look forward to bringing more resources to the Navajo Nation in terms of the uh, animal welfare, taking care of our, our pets and our livestock. Thank you so much. God bless. President Nez. Now we have Vice President Myron Leiser with a few remarks and closing prayer. All right, thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Mr. President. Looks like we had a little technical difficulties here, but uh, as she said, uh, a few remarks here, and I uh, just want to thank President. I also want to thank uh, the Office of the First Lady and Second Lady. Thank you for putting on this animal wellness seminar, webinar, uh, virtually, and uh, the benefactors are all the animals across our land, and uh, we just want to advocate for those animals uh, all the domestic pets and all the animals and to be, uh, I guess, uh, participating in the relief of uh, their care and the relief of, uh, you know, the burden on the Navajo Nation. The president said 250,000 um, stray animals. And so we just want to thank you again for uh, tuning in and also be a part of the, the, the great scheme of things that uh, will help, you know, and, and enhance the quality of life here on Navajo. So again, our kudos to uh, First Lady Fafilia and Second Lady Dottie. And uh, we just want to thank you all again for tuning in. Uh, what a great thing to consider the animals. And uh, as I mentioned that, um, God, um, Dottie did mention, Second Lady mentioned uh, on the fifth day, since 124, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And in verse 25, God created each of these animals, livestock and creatures to their kinds that move along the ground. All the creepy little things that crawl. Another uh, version says, and God saw that it was good. It was good. And so we appreciate the ability that we have animals that we have, uh, I guess, uh, stewardship over. Uh, we challenge you, we exhort you all, Chidene, all across the land to take care of all of the animals that we have here and uh, to spay and neuter, also to, um, you know, maybe even take in when you're considering a new animal, a new pet, to go to the shelters and uh, take in a pet that needs a home that 
that deserves a home. And so that's what this was all designed to do is to bring awareness uh, of our problem of uh, stray animals on the land, but also to challenge you and exhort you all, all across the land to uh, take better care of what we have, God's creation. So with that, I'll close in prayer. And again, thank you all for tuning in. Looking forward to uh, being able to be with you again real soon. Uh, and in this pandemic, we're all together and uh, let's be safe, right? Continue to mask up, continue to uh, uh, exercise social distancing and the like, and limit your travel. So I uh, appreciate it. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll close with the prayer. God, God, we thank you, Lord, that we read that you're, you provided these animals for us. So Lord, we thank you that we are stewards for them. We pray for your yeah. wisdom, Lord in which to be able to uh, assist the animals, assist families, Lord, and also to advocate for those, Lord, that are uh, struggling with the animals, Lord. May we all rise up to the occasion, Lord, and take better care of our animals. Let us be good stewards of all of our animals, Lord. And Father, let us uh, continue to uh, look to you for all the answers, Lord, for every good thing comes from above the Father of lights. So bless the animals in the land, bless all of our inhabitants, Lord, uh, humans, Canines, felines, equines, and on and on, right? I think I see and uh, the like. So again, we appreciate you all. And we lift up this prayer in the name of our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. And everybody said, amen. So until we see you again next time, everybody take care. Uh, may God bless the Navajo Nation and may God bless you all. Yeah, long.